Ja, god god kveld, gode økonomiinteresserte borgere av Stavanger og verden og andre steder. My name is Torbjørn Røe Isaksen. I'm the political editor of E24, en skipsted medium. And uh, tonight I'm interviewing and talking to Oliver Bullo, who's the author of a really interesting book because I've been reading it for the past few weeks. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a page turner, but it's about the dark sides of international finance. That's the easy way of phrasing it. And I have to say, just to, to, just to have the commercial plug as well, that it's especially interesting for me now because E24 has been one of the uh, has been the leading publication in what has been known as the Dubai Uncovered stories, which is basically an, uh, a leak from Dubai that covers all sorts of illegal properties or dodgy properties in Dubai, where amongst other things we find that millions of Norwegian kroner have been put into the uh, Dubai property market. Uh, but this book is not about Dubai; it's about Britain's role. And uh, I want to welcome you, Oliver. We're on first names, right? Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. Thank you very good. much. Yeah, good to be here. Um, and this is obviously, it's not your first book. Uh, you've written books before. Um, Moneyland, some people might have read, which covered some of the same issues here. But what, what got you interested in these topics that you're writing about in this book? Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's really good to be back in Stavanger. I, I was here a few years ago when my last book came out, and then COVID happened, and it feels like 100 centuries has passed, and yet here we all are again. Um, so I'm a, a, a Russianist. Um, uh, I always was fascinated by Russia growing up in mid Wales, um, much to the confusion of my parents. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who uh, we, we farmed sheep, and they couldn't really understand where this passion for Russia came from. Um, but sort of from my perspective, you know, this was in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Eastern Europe was just where everything was happening. It seemed to be the, the cockpit of history. You know, um, and I was very interested in history, and so I thought that Russia was just the most fascinating place in the world. I mean, I still think it's one of the most fascinating places in the world. It, it always, there's always something happening in Russia. It's not necessarily a good thing. Um, so I moved to Russia in, in, when I finished university, uh, I suppose in the kind of naive expectation that I would be witnessing the development of democracy and, you know, there were growing pains and, you know, mafia violence and this, that and the other. But I suppose I thought that over the years I was there, I would witness democracy growing and prosperity and, and Russia joining the European family of nations, which was sort of the narrative at the time. I mean, as it turned out, um, about two and a half, three weeks before I arrived in St. Petersburg in the autumn of 1999, Russia got a new prime minister, um, a man called Vladimir Putin, uh, who since then has been prime minister and president and prime minister again, president again. And I think now he's likely to remain president um, for the rest of his life. And obviously the story has not been a story of democracy and prosperity, but rather of the opposite, as Putin has, he, you know, it wasn't that 1990s Russia was perfect in any means, but it had developed some independent institutions, some, you know, new political parties, new media, new businesses, um, and, and he gradually crushed all of that, all the various advances that had been made, and reshaped Russia in his image while giving all of its resources to his friends, a very, very small number of people made an incredible amount of money. And so I, I'm, I suppose what, what b began to interest me is what went wrong. You know, why didn't Russia become the place that we hoped it would become? You know, why didn't it join the European family of nations? Why has it become a place where it is now illegal to call a war a war? Um, and, and that's what my books have been about. This is my fourth book. Um, but. The more time I spent in Russia, the more I became aware of the role that corruption played in holding back development, progress, democracy, and benefiting kleptocracy, autocracy. And the more I studied corruption, the more I looked into how Putin's friends had stolen their fortunes and kept their fortunes safe, the more I realized that this is a, not a story only about Russia, 
but also a story about Britain. And it feels in a way that Britain and Russia are, in a strange way, twins. Um, because you know, Russia has this fiercely nationalist ruling class who regularly advertise themselves for how nationalist they are, how Russian Orthodox they are, how much they believe in the Russian nation. And yet, when it comes to their money, they don't believe in the Russian nation at all. They export their money as much as they can. Russia is unique among large countries in that more than half of Russian national wealth is outside Russia. Um, it's an astonishing statistic. The average for Euro European countries is about 10%, and yet for Russia, for the best estimate, it's somewhere around 51, 52% of all the country's wealth is outside Russia. And because the country is incredibly unequal, more unequal than any other major country, that is the oligarch's wealth, and they export it, and they buy property, houses, football clubs, politicians, and things like that in, in, in other countries. So that's Russia, a place where the politicians believe in nationalism, orthodoxy, autocracy, as the, you know, the great trilogy, the great triumvirate of, of the Russian Empire. But what about Britain? Well, Britain is a place that believes in democracy and freedom and NATO and the West. And yet when it comes to money, we're just as hypocritical as the Russians because we're the place where the anti-democrats, the anti-Westerners put their money. So in a weird way, Britain and Russia, the two great empires, Britain no longer an empire, Russia still an empire, but a bit shaky, um, exist in this sort of strange um, dance between each other in that, you know, Russia puts its money in Britain, Britain, you know, keeps that money safe, and both countries pretend to be something other than that they are. And, and this is what the book's about. It's about the, Britain's role in supporting the kleptocrats, the anti-democrats, not just from Russia. I mean, we're, we're, we are equal opportunity. Um, <laughs> if you have money, wherever it's from. I mean, and not just criminals either. I mean, anyone with money. But in the book is mainly, I'm mainly interested in criminals. And, uh, and so that's what the book's about. And it, it's, um, I'd like to say, though it is, a, it is inherently a depressing story, um, I try and make it funny. Uh, as as, um, as, as uh, George Orwell showed, you, you know, you don't have to stop being funny just because you're being serious. <laughs> You also, I, I, I bet a lot of people here have been, have been to London as tourists and just, you, you also actually have a tourist attraction in London <laughs> yeah. where you show what some people call Moscow on the Thames or London grad. Could you just shortly tell us about that before we go more into the book? So, so the kleptocracy tours, they're not, they weren't my idea. I wish they had been. It's my friend Roman Borisovich, who's very good at, at coming up with silly ideas. Um, and he had this idea for the kleptocracy tours, which is because, you know, it, it, it's quite hard to get through to people quite how important London is as a centre for kleptocracy and criminal finance, because it doesn't look like that. I mean, if, I'm sure many of you have been to London. You know what it looks like. It, it just looks like a bustling you know, very busy European city, right? But, but because a house that's owned by an honest businessman and a house that's owned by a kleptocrat, they look the same, it's just a house. Um, so we, the kleptocracy tour was our attempt to cut through that and we put people on a bus, drive them around West London, mainly West London, if the traffic was light, we'd also go to North London, <laughs> and point out houses that belong to kleptocrats. And I mean, it's a target rich environment, there are so many. Um, <laughs> But really, it was just our, our ambition was limited by the appetite of our guests to hear yet more stories of people who stole fortunes. But it's um, it's amazing. I mean, my my personal favourite. Uh, I, I tell the story in here. Um, uh, partly I like the story, but partly I like the fact that whenever we turned up outside his house, he called the police, which was always funny. Um, but he's a guy called Dmitry Firtash, who a Ukrainian uh, oligarch, who made a gigantic fortune in partnership with Russia's gas company, Gazprom, in overcharging Ukrainians for gas. He, they increased the prices for gas hugely that Russia sold to Ukraine after Ukraine had a pro-Western revolution. Um, and, it, you know, having made a huge amount of money, essentially overcharging his own country for gas, in such a way that he actually destroyed that government that came to power in a pro-Western revolution. This is a man who acted directly contrary to the West's interests for a, a stable, democratic, pro-Western Ukraine. He brought his money to London, where he became, within four years, so integrated into the British establishment that he got to meet the Queen's husband. 
He was given a medal by Cambridge University for his outstanding generosity. Um, he created a foundation with multiple members of the House of Lords on the foundation board. He wasn't party political, they were from all parties. Um, and he bought himself a mansion, a 60 million pound mansion, um, and, uh, and a tube station. Um, <laughs> which I, I, I think he's the only private owner of a tube station in London, but he didn't just buy a tube station, he bought a tube station from the Ministry of Defence. Um, it's extraordinary the extent to which no one thought that was a bad idea. This is like a genuinely like a close business associate of Vladimir Putin, and we sold him access to core national infrastructure. He had a, a sta his own staircase descending to the tube. It's amazing. We're, we're, uh, we, we are going to get more into how, what are these mechanisms and what are the ways that you can sneak in or buy your way into uh, established society in Britain. But let's just start with the most obvious thing, and you see it here on the cover as well, and the book, of course, is on sale. It's translated into Norwegian, uh, uh, in case you wondered. It's for sale after our conversation here. But what we've just been witnessing now, for some, uh, a few weeks ago, we witnessed uh, a display of so many things that the world considers English, British, uh, with the death of Queen Elizabeth II. And one of the most British things signaling elegance, arist aristocracy, and also a certain kind of decency is, of course, the butler. Mm -hmm. But the butler here is your picture for Britain's role in, in, in helping all these kleptocrats. How did that picture come to you? So this, this the, the butler idea, it drives from a conversation I had because of the kleptocracy tours and because I was often quoted in articles talking about kleptocracy. Um, when foreign journalists or academics came to the UK to write about money laundering, they'd often get in touch and ask me to help them. And, I, and there was a, an American called Andrew who wanted to research, but specifically Chinese money laundering, which is a, you know, it's a, it, it's its own thing because of the specifics of Chinese uh, the Chinese economy, but basically it's another big thing in London. It's another growth industry. Um, and he wanted to ask me about this. And, and he, I was trying to explain to him that he, he was trying to work out who was fighting Chinese money laundering. And I was trying to explain to him that no one is. And, <laughs> and he couldn't get his head around why this was happening, because he was coming from America where, where people investigate and prosecute and things and, like that. And he was really asking, because oh, yeah, he, he really was, didn't understand. Oh, no, genuinely. So, these are not, but are they, perhaps? Exactly. He kept, he kept thinking, you know, OK, if you don't have an equivalent of the prosecutors of the Southern District of New York, who's the equivalent of the FBI? And I was like, hmm. No. Uh, who's the equivalent of the Dep Department of Justice's kleptocracy unit? I was like, mm. and, and so and it was getting embarrassing. Um, so eventually I had to say, look, you, you don't understand. America, you're the policeman to the world, right? You, you, you have rules, you enforce them on people. That's what you do. You have prosecutors and investigators who do that. We don't do that. Um, we are, and I was trying to think, what are we? And this image of a butler came to mind. Because, you know, a butler is, they're very polite, they're well-dressed. You know, but they do what they're paid to do, and they solve problems for their clients. And, and so it's a very British image, but it's a very sort of polite, but also, you know, very competent, very servile. Um, so I did actually try to become a butler. I, I did enrol briefly. Butler, butler training is a thing, another British industry. You can train. A lot of it went online during the pandemic. So if you're interested in learning any butler skills, um, you can learn, for example, how to open and close a door. Uh, that would cost you £4.99. Um, other skills, like how to lay a table, are more expensive. Do but, they but still iron newspapers? I, I, uh, I, I don't know if that was included. I didn't look at all the videos, how okay. to iron a newspaper, but that may be in there. Um, certainly how to iron a tablecloth is in there. Um, but so not being able to learn to be a butler, because I, they rumbled quite quickly that I didn't really want to be a butler. Um, uh, I, I started reading um, the P.G. Woodhouse Jeeves and Worcester stories. Um, which I'm sure many of you know, right? They're, they're, are they big here? Uh, I think a lot of people know them, yes. Yeah. And there was a TV show yeah. um, with Stephen Fry in the 1990s. And so I think a lot of people, because of the TV show and it's Stephen Fry and everyone loves Stephen Fry, people have this idea that Jeeves is a kind of kindly, you know, helpful, twinkly-eyed gentleman. He's a rogue. Um, <laughs> so, so, seriously, if you read the books, there's a five-volume omnibus. Of the, there's a lot of stories. He was writing them from 1916 to 1975, so he was writing them for a long time. Um, Jeeves gets up to a, some really nasty behaviour. Um, 
uh, particularly with regard to police officers. He, 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 he bribes a police officer, he, he impersonates a senior police officer, he assaults a police mm. officer. And there's a wonderful quote where, uh, because you use the word bribe now, but it's a wonderful a English present. way of, yeah, because yeah, you, what does he say? You've said, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't bribe the officer, so I gave him a little present. I, <laughs> and, uh, which is exactly something that was said to me in Ukraine by a lawyer. Just, it's like a little present. Um, you know, it's amazing. He, 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 he drugs a fellow valet in order to steal things from him. He's, you know, he becomes an illegal book maker. Jeeves is a, is a, is a criminal um, and an enabler of criminality. And why does he do it? He does it because he's being paid. And, um, and so I found it instructive to read the Jeeves and Worcester books, partly because they're funny, but partly because it's amazing how many parallels there are between what Jeeves does in the stories and what Britain has ended up doing for its oligarch clients. And, and, um, and I found that really helpful. There, there are uh, a lot of, you meet a lot of people in this book. One of the characters, um, in a way, is, is also the city of London itself, the financial center of Britain. And you describe it from, from its, not origins, but it started off as sort of an old boys club with, uh, with, uh, with um, the people from the elite schools who all knew each other and addressed each other by first names. But then some, something happened, some, some revolutions in a way happened that were the financial tools for making this butler for the world possible. Could you expand a bit on that, please? Yeah, the, the city of London is a genuinely fascinating place. And I don't think it's fully understood how amazing it is. Um, it may be, and I don't know if this is true, but apart from possibly the papacy, the city of London may be the oldest continuously existing political entity in the world. It's, it's existed since certainly the Saxon times, probably the seventh century, and, and its boundaries are further, its boundaries go back to Roman times, and it governs itself. It has an elected leader, it has had an elected leader, certainly since um, the time, since for a thousand years. And, and, it, and it looks, and it's constantly changing. It's always in the business of making money, whether that's trading or moving money around. And obviously, you know, Britain is famous for having had an empire, but the empire was really, the city of London's empire, you know, who, who conquered India. It wasn't Britain, it was, a, it was the East India Company, a city of London company. You know, the great slave traders was not Brit, it was the Royal African Society, which is a city of London company. Trading with Russia, it's the same. It was the Hudson Bay Company with Canada. The, the, the British Empire was conquered by private companies chartered in the city of London, answerable to their shareholders, who were the wealthy people of the city of London. So when the, Briti when the British Empire came to an end, you know, which obviously, sort of really accelerated from the 1940s into the 1950s, the city of London, it, it sort of what was it for anymore? You know, it didn't have this role that it had had moving money to India and Australia and Canada and so on. Um, and it had always, you know, it had used pounds. Pounds were the international currency. But the pound was eclipsed by the dollar. Britain was bankrupt. It, was, it, it spent all of its money on the Second World War. The pound was no longer the world's currency anymore. So what was it to do? Um, and there's this astonishing moment you know, what's, what's amazing about this is there is a moment when the butlering business begins. Because Britain, obviously, it used to be the oligarch, right? You know, what Putin's currently doing to Ukraine, that's what Britain used to do um, if it didn't agree with the country's trade policy. Send in the Navy and they'd change their mind pretty fast. Um, <laughs> and that was, um, the, amazingly, the, the, mo the shortest war I think ever fought was between the British Empire and Zanzibar. It lasted 45 minutes. Um, uh, um, anyway, leaving that aside, um, we didn't like their trade policy. Um, the, so what was the, British, the, the, the city of London to do? Because you had all these bankers who, who had jobs and, and they liked the way they earned a living, but they couldn't earn a living anymore because no one, was, no one wanted to employ them to move pound sterlings around because no one wanted pound sterlings. Um, and then there's this moment in 1955 when the Soviet Union, which was using dollars, like everyone was using dollars then to, to finance its trade, was worried that if it kept its dollars in New York, which is where dollars were kept at the time, that if there were an international crisis, the dollars would be frozen. So it looked for somewhere else where it could bank its dollars. And it had a bank in London, the Moskowski Narodny Bank, a Soviet-owned, London-based bank. And it decided to keep its, back, its, its dollars there. And they needed to do something with their dollars, so they looked around with something to do with them. And a British bank, the Midland Bank, which is a small high street bank, which needed money to fund its operations, borrowed the dollars to fund its operations. And, and by doing this, 
they discovered, the two banks discovered this extraordinary thing, which is that there were, at the time, very strict rules about what you could do with money. America had very strict restrictions on the interest rates you could charge. There were very strict restrictions in Britain on what you could do with pounds, where they could go. But by moving dollars to London, suddenly they discovered that they'd managed to avoid all the rules in, completely. Since they were in London, there were no US rules. They didn't apply. They only existed in America. Because they were using dollars, there were no British rules. They only applied to pounds. So they'd essentially managed to create an entirely unregulated form of financial activity. And anyone who's got anything to do with financial activity realizes that the fewer regulations, the larger the profits. Um, and there were no regulations at all. So the profits were essentially sky high. Um, and as soon as they started doing it, the word got out. Other people started doing it. All the British banks got in on the game. Then the American banks moved in, realized they could do it too. Then the European banks, Japanese banks, all the banks moved to the city of London because if there are no rules, then there are lots of profits. And so everyone's faced with the prospect of their financial services industries just vanishing and piling into London. And, and so all the other countries started to relax their regulations to try and keep up with the fact there were no regulations, which is why all the restrictions placed on finance at the end of the Second World War to try and safeguard democracy, learning the lessons of the 1920s and 30s to safeguard democracy from unrestrained finance, all of those fell away. This is the role of the City of London. And it's amazing if you look at who this was done for, who, whose interests the City of London was serving, was they were serving the interests of the Soviet Union in 1955, at the height of the Cold War, they, they were banking money for the Soviet Union, earning fees for Britain in order to frustrate the ambitions of the Americans. And that's a really interesting parallel to what's being done with the oligarchs now. Right? You say, we, we will take money from oligarchs, hide money from oligarchs, so the Americans can't find it. It's exactly what was happening in the 1950s. And occasionally, sort of British politicians will, if I'm you know, giving evidence to a parliamentary committee or whatever, will say to me, you know, how much Russian money is there in London? And so when are we going to start counting? Because it's not, this didn't begin in 1991, this, this butlering business. You have to go back to 1955. And that money has been earning more money. And you know, what even counts as Russian money anymore? Because none of this money exists in, in Britain, particularly, or in, or in Russia. It's somewhere else. Because when they created this loophole, where you could use dollars in London and, and suddenly avoid the rules. They, they needed a new term to describe this weird legal situation where there were no rules. And they borrowed a term from maritime law. What happens when you get in a boat and you go out of reach of land and there are no rules anymore because there's no government? And, and you call that offshore. And that's what they called it, offshore finance. That's where it came from. And I think it's genuinely, in terms of its impact on the world, the most consequential British invention, probably, certainly of the second half of the 20th century. Apart from, I don't know, possibly um, uh, One Direction. <laughs> take that. Yeah, take or, that. Yeah. Um, the Beatles. All right, OK, there have been others. Football was but, earlier. But, but, what, what strikes me is, so the city of London is, is, is the heart, and this revolution happens. But what, what strikes me is that several of, because you travel in this book, you go to these areas where some of the money, money laundering or offshoring or speculative financial transactions are, are being done. And what strikes me is that several of these, the city of London, for example, was in a crisis when they had to, they had to do something or they stumbled upon this. Uh, you go to the British Virgin Islands, um, uh, yeah. w which, which was dirt poor. Yeah. Uh, Gibraltar, which was really nothing, Struggling. didn't have a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and then they, they, they stumble upon, almost by coincidence, the Virgin Islands, for example, this way of getting money or companies from all over the world to register with them. Yeah, I mean, it, this isn't a conspiracy. It's important to know that there isn't sort of somewhere in the city of London a, a kind of a man with a white cat, um, you know, <laughs> plotting how to destroy democracy everywhere. This is just profitable. You know, there is, a, there is, a, there is a, a, a huge industry of people looking for opportunities all the time, you know, probing weaknesses, finding loopholes, encouraging politicians to open new loopholes. Um, you know, it's often in small places like the British Virgin Islands where the politicians are also always looking for new ways of making a living. So there is a, a whole enabling industry of people constantly looking for new ways to make a living, but it isn't directed. You know, it is, a, it is organic and constantly spreading. And so places, all the places that were, made, that were left when the British Empire was, at, was dead, there were a few places that were too small, too remote, too poor, 
too strategic for Britain to want to make them independent, of which the British Virgin Islands is one, Gibraltar is another. But when it comes to the Virgin Islands, for example, which is one of the cases you use, you meet a... They come across as a really nice couple. Oh, they're lovely. A uh, yeah. lovely couple. And they basically invented the tax paradise that's the Virgin Islands today. Yeah. H how did that come about? So he, he, it's, he was a, he's British, but he was born and brought up in, in East Africa, um, in, in what was then called Tanganyika, but what's now called Tanzania. Um, and so he, that, that's where he's from. His wife was also from uh, East Africa. And, and they grew up there. And then when, when it became independent, um, they remained there and stayed there um, for about another, um, almost a decade. But it was, Tanzania was becoming increasingly Maoist. Um, and he's very much not a Maoist man. Um, Ox Oxford educated. Not many uh, Maoists no, in finance. No, generally. he was exactly. Yeah. He, was, he was not a Maoist barrister. Um, so, he, so he eventually decided he had to leave. Um, but the problem in common with quite a lot of people who had lived in the British Empire, when they came back, came back to Britain, often they weren't, they'd never lived in Britain, they came back to Britain and they hated it. Taxes were high, weather was awful. Um, <laughs> Very expensive place to be. This was the 1970s when it was a really tough time. Lots of lots of strikes, lots of um, you know militant unions, the kind of things that you really don't approve of if you're um, that kind of gentleman. And um, <laughs> so he needed somewhere else to go. And he heard about the British Virgin Islands. He thought, oh, well, I'll go there. You know, it's still a colony. It's sunny. Um, not much going on. And while and while he was there, um, he took a phone call from a an American lawyer who was looking for someone who could create a shell company for him. And he's like, sure, I'll do that. You know, just, how hard can it be? Just explain, what's a shell company? So a shell company is a company that exists just to contain assets. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't trade. It doesn't, it doesn't operate as a business. It's just like a, an, an, an envelope that you can put around something to hide the fact that you own it. Um, and it's very, very useful for hiding that you own it. It's also very useful for dodging taxes. And at the time, as now, there was a lot of demand for dodging taxes. And it became the entire basis of the British Virgin Island economy was selling shell companies. Um, it's amazing that the, this is a place that had, at the time, subsistence level agriculture was basically how the, almost the entire population made their living. This is a, a Caribbean, very, very small Caribbean territory, British still only because it was too poor to be independent. Um, and now, it's, if you go there, it, it's, it's as prosperous as any ordinary European country. And all of the prosperity is based from selling secrecy to foreigners. But just, just take us through, I mean, how, how can you, not the whole process, but if, you've, if, you've, if you want to hide your money, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, how do you, literally, how do you do it? How, do you, how can you hide billions of dollars from your government? Well, well let, let's pretend you are the government. Let's say you're the president of Angola just to pluck a country out sounds, of the air. Sounds fairly and nice. And let's say yeah. that there's a civil war happening in your country, and your army, your army, the one fighting for you, needs to buy food and uniforms and, and everything in order to maintain itself in the fight against your personal enemies. Um, and if you establish, uh, let's say, a company in the British Virgin Islands, which is in the uniform and food selling business, um, you can buy the food for, that your army needs and the uniforms your army needs, double the price, and then sell them from your own company to yourself, right? And therefore, the money that is raised in taxes in Angola goes to buy food and uniform for the army, but you're buying it from yourself. So essentially, you're using a British Virgin Islands company to disguise the fact that you are supplying yourself at a markup of 100%, and therefore stealing half of the money that goes to supply your own army. And this is the same trick that, uh, say, um, health ministers will use in Ukraine or Russia, that they need to buy vaccines for the children in the country. But why should the children get all the benefit from the vaccines? <laughs> um, so if, if instead of buying them directly from Pfizer or AstraZeneca or whoever, you buy them from ABC Incorporated of the British Virgin Islands, who in turn buy them from Pfizer or, or AstraZeneca, then you also get you know, some of that lovely vaccine-related benefit to yourself. So it, it is, it's just an... The British Virgin Islands provides an additional unnecessary step in the business process, whereby you can insert yourself into the chain, add a, a profit margin, 10%, 20%, 50%. And so essentially you get to take some of the money. But no one knows it's you because they don't tell you who owns their company. But let's say you're not a, you're not a kleptocrat. You're not the president of Angola or some country. You're, you're a regular European billionaire. 
and you put your money in the uh, Virgin Islands. And then the Norwegian government, for example, comes to London or to Britain and say that, well, we really want to find out if this billionaire pays enough taxes, so can you show us what you have? We'd, we'd love to help, but the thing is, it's British, but it's not that British. Um, it's British when it wants to be. It's British-ish. It's, Brit yeah. it's British when it wants to be, but it isn't when it doesn't want to be. I mean, to be honest, Britain has cracked down to a certain extent. It's, now, it's not as easy now to hide as it used to be, because it had got really out of hand. Um, but so it is now, you know, if you're that billionaire, I'd probably advise you to I'd, I'd come up with some tips. But, but I'd advise you to, to come up with a more complex structure. It's no longer enough just to have the British Virgin Islands. But it's worth, important to remember, the money isn't in the British Virgin Islands. All of the British Virgin Islands is just, it's just like an, a protective screen around where the money's gone. The money is probably in London or New York or, or Miami. Um, it's just gone through the British Virgin Islands and they've put up a barrier that means no one can follow where it's gone. Because it's, it's incredibly quick to create these companies. If you're in the business of creating these companies, you can create them in, a, in, in an afternoon for what's $450, um, and it's done. But for police agencies to try and cut through that barrier, it's going to take them months. And, they, and you know that they're trying to cut through it. So you can just keep creating more barriers behind it. And every single one they have to burn through, and, it, and it's time consuming. So it, makes, it means that for the people with assets, they can move their money as freely as they like. They can have a complete vision of the whole world. They can operate wherever they like. But if, you, if a police agency is trying to follow it, they have to go to every different country, every different jurisdiction, separate legal proceedings in every single one. And because there are so many different bits of Britain, there's Britain, there's Jersey, there's Guernsey, there's the, the Isle of Man, there's the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Anguilla, Gibraltar. All of them have their own courts. They're all not quite independent, but they're also not British either. So you have to go to every single one. You can't just go to London and sort it out. And that's very useful if you're very rich. So, the, uh, so I've uh, plundered my country, yeah. or I've set up something on the Virgin Islands, or, or, or uh, made myself rich through gambling in Gib Gibraltar, or I'm an oil uh, shake from the Middle East, or something like that. I, what, I really want now is some respectability. Mm, yeah. So I don't want to be seen as a crook. I want to be seen as part of society, as someone who contributes. How can the butler help me with that? Well, we have, we have those services available. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, they, they I don't... love that this has turned into some kind of play now. <laughs> well, I mean, you are a former government minister <laughs> yeah, from an yeah, oil-rich yeah. country. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, you, you, so, so what you would need to do um, is establish initially some kind of foundation um, and invite people to be on uh, the board of the foundation. Now, fortunately, there are people who can advise you on this, who, which, which politicians to approach, because politicians, some politicians are more interested than others in earning this kind of money. But there are quite a lot who are interested, and they will be on the board, and they will then give you a veneer of respectability. Look who my friends are. You know, Lord, this Lord, that Baron, this Baroness, they're my friends, and they will be at your parties with you. And, and you just, just make this a bit even more concrete, because you tell of the, you, you, you describe this quite in detail yeah. in one concrete case, so, the so Dimit U Ukrainian uh, Dimitri oligarch. Dimitri Firtash, the man who owns the tube station, he arrives in London in 2007, shortly after his, his coup, when he's made all this money by overcharging the Ukrainians for gas. He creates the British Ukrainian Society. He invites various members of the House of Lords, Lord Asquith, a Liberal Democrat, uh, Baroness Smith, a Labour peer, um, and uh, a Tory peer whose name escapes me, um, to be on the, on the board. They represent him at sort of functions. Um, he, he establishes a, you know, a completely bland purpose to encourage understanding between Ukraine and the United Kingdom. Um, he is, has parties and, and, and soirees, you know, musical evenings. He gives money to Cambridge University. And, and that means that you are no longer an unknown oligarch. You are now a, a philanthropist with a reputation for charity. And if you have a reputation in Britain, then you have a reputation to defend. And that means if, if some terrible journalist comes along and writes about you um, and how you earned your money, then you can sue them for blackening your reputation in Britain because you're a philanthropist and how dare they write about you in this way. And, and if, you know, bringing illegal proceedings in Britain is incredibly expensive. Um, I, I have a, a, an ongoing legal proceeding in Angola Sorry, in Portugal, I'm being sued by the vice president of Angola, um, which is stressful and annoying and time-consuming. But so far, um, 
it has cost me uh, 4,000 euros. Um, if I had that equivalent court case in the United Kingdom so far, it probably would have cost me a quarter of a million pounds. Um, that's the difference between the British legal system and, and a civil law legal system. Um, so most people, if they get threatened with legal proceedings by a wealthy plaintiff, just, just give up immediately. They say, you know, this, this happened last week. Chatham House, a very respected British think tank, um, published a report on kleptocracy in which they mentioned one gentleman uh, of Russian Turkmen origin. They mentioned him, I thought, in a fairly inoffensive way. He threatened them with legal proceedings. They were looking at half a million pounds worth of fees, and they just removed him completely from the report. That was it. Just because it's better to do that than it is to, um, to fight the case because it's so expensive. No one, no one can afford it. It's very, very expensive. So, so, so what you've done, you've arrived in Britain, you've, you've gained a few friends at the cost of not that much money compared to how much you have, maybe just a few million pounds. You've gained a reputation. That means people can't write about you. Um, you can buy some property. You can hide your ownership of that property via you know, the British Virgin Islands. So no one really knows you own it, but you've got a lovely house. You can, you know, Britain is what, the second or third largest fine art market in the world. So you can buy a load of paintings to keep your money safe in a nice portable form. Um, <laughs> and, and you've got wonderful private schools to educate your children. We've got universities to educate your children when they get a little bit older. Um, we, and, it's, and, and best of all, um, we have law enforcement agencies that are so underfunded that even if you did steal your fortune, they're never going to know. There's never been a single court case against an oligarch, in, a Russian oligarch in the UK. I wanted to let you know that we're, we, we do have time at the very end for a few questions, if anybody uh, wants to ask a couple of questions. But I have to emphasize questions, not comments or, or, or new presentations or anything like that. <laughs> But we'll, we're going to move now for the last 10 minutes or so um, into some of the more like the politics and the, yeah. the future of this. What can we do? But just one question before that. So with this whole world, and it's much more than you've described now in our conversation, and it's not only Russians or Ukrainians, but what happens when Russia invades Ukraine? How does that change the picture? Because all of a sudden, this reaches the headlines. It, it, it is extraordinary the electric effect it had on political discussion. Um, in January, um, so okay, in December last year, um, Joe Biden, President Biden, convened a summit, Summit of Democracy, in which all the democracies gathered, the leaders of democracies gathered, and made promises for what they would do to make the world safe for democracy. Boris Johnson, our then prime minister, I think eight prime ministers ago, um, <laughs> uh, he, he made these promises, that we're going to do these, these various legal reforms to make it harder to launder money via the UK. And, you know, he's... He, I mean, who could have predicted that he would break his word? Um, <laughs> he... He did break his word, spoiler. Um, uh, so in January, um, a government minister resigned live in Parliament. He stood up and said, I'm disgusted by the fact that, that, that we had this opportunity to do something about financial crime, and we haven't done it. He's basically, the Prime Minister made a promise to the President of the United States. He broke it within a month of having made it. This is disgusting. And he quit. So that's mid-January this year. In February, obviously, Putin sent his troops in to, towards Kiev. It looked like, you know, Ukraine was going to fall. Suddenly, this sort of folly of having enabled the creation of Russian kleptocracy for so long is immediately apparent. I mean, it's amazing it wasn't apparent before, considering all the things Russia has done, but it was finally apparent. And all of those things that Johnson promised Joe Biden that he would do, that he broke his promise about, he then, the promise is back on. All of those things have now been done, or they are currently being done. Um, so it has changed a lot of discussion. There's been a, a huge swathe of oligarchs have been sanctioned, as they have in the EU and Canada and uh, the US and, and, and other countries. Um, so there has been a big change in, in attitude. But we're coming from a very low base. So in order to try and gain the expertise required to not just sanction oligarchs but actually prosecute them, we need to create an entire apparatus around that. I mean, to show quite how far behind the curve the UK was, after the start of this phase of the conflict in Ukraine, so in, February, uh, in early March, actually, it was, um, 
one of our leading law enforcement agencies asked me to go in to tell them about Russian kleptocracy. I'm very happy to do that. It's great. Um, but I'm a journalist, and they're law enforcement. If there's briefings, it normally happens in the other direction. You expect police officers to give briefings to journalists. You don't expect them to be so uninformed about what's happening that they invite journalists in to tell them what's going on. And that's where we're at. So, you know, there has been a political change, but even if it's sustained, which is not a given, then it's going to take so long to build up any expertise that it's, it's not really clear that any big difference can be made anytime soon. But there have been major legislative changes. And, and they are not just directed against Russians, but kleptocrats, other well, effect, money laundering issues in general. So, or? so the legislative changes would affect uh, money launderers, kleptocrats from anywhere. But the sanctions have been all related to Russia. Um, uh, yeah, because they've been specifically in response. Do you think there's a turning back? I mean, if we don't know how the war in Ukraine ends, but will there be, uh, will we just be a return to what was normal for so many decades? Or is this, there's no going back from this? This is a fundamental change for the years to come. It's hard to believe they'll be going back with regard to Russians, certainly not anytime soon. Though it should be said after the invasion of, sorry, after the, annexation of Crimea and the invasion of Ukraine in 2014, they, there were sanctions which gradually sort of dissipated and, and business became as usual again. So there is a precedent, but that was a far less terrible conflict than what we have now. And it's been far less controversial. So I would be very surprised if there was a return to business as usual with Russia. But there are, what, 180 something countries in the world. Many of them have oligarchs. So yes, the Russian ones might not be quite so welcome at Heathrow anymore. But there's Azeris, there's Kazakhs, there's Uzbeks, there's Ukrainians, there's Moldovans, there's Angolans, Nigerians, Egyptians, Bahrainis, Qataris, Malaysians, Chinese. Basically everyone. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Norwegians. Yeah. You know, I understand you've had all these tax changes, so I'm sure there might be some Norwegians looking, looking at I'll, London. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask you the uh, obligatory question about Norway, but just, just one question uh, before we get there and before we open if there are any questions. And it's a question, it's an issue that I've been interested in. I mentioned the Dubai Uncovered that E24 has been working on. And what we see is, and what fascinated me, is that on the one side, it's the world you're describing. It's, it's uh, uh, kleptocrats, it's crime, it's money laundering. But on the other hand, we also have a lot of perfectly legal tax planning that looks a lot like what you're describing here as well, just without some of the dodgier characters. IKEA, for example, we all buy their furniture. They were exposed a few years ago, and they have the same sort of setup with company here, and it's a shell company there. So is there, even though, of course, we have to distinguish between criminal and, and just normal, regular, honest business, but are there any links here? It's a really good point, and, and absolutely there are. Um, if the problem was only kleptocrats, using London to hide their money, it wouldn't be a problem, right? Because they don't really have a lobby protecting them of any meaningful sense. The problem is that also huge corporations, very wealthy, other people who aren't, who are just legally owned but don't like paying taxes, they use exactly the same services. They move their money through the same places. The British Virgin Islands is not only for criminals. It's also used by major corporations to, to structure their business deals. So absolutely, the, the challenge is trying to find a way to craft legislative changes that affect kleptocrats without annoying Google. Um, and that's a real challenge because they, they don't like paying taxes any more than oligarchs do. Yeah. But the, the irony, of course, is that while one of the most potent political discussions in a lot of countries is should taxes go up and down, millions and millions are disappearing from public budgets simply because of tax planning internationally. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and it is particularly the case with uh, the big tech companies, from which so much of the value they generate is related to their intellectual property rather than to physical assets. And you can put intellectual property wherever you like. So if you put your intellectual property in Bermuda, then all of the royalties earned for that intellectual property are tax-free. And then if Bermuda puts its tax rate up, you can just move your intellectual property to you know, wherever you like, the Bahamas, to Jersey, um, to Singapore. 
I mean, it, it's, it's, everything is very, very mobile. And this is something that the world is really struggling to respond to. And President Biden did have some quite interesting ideas uh, for reforming this problem to try and ensure that there could be a minimum rate of 15, it's not much, but 15% for these big companies. But at the moment, it's sadly hostage to the whims of uh, Viktor Orban, who doesn't like it. Uh, and without him liking it, the EU can't do it. Without the EU doing it, the UK won't do it. Without the EU and the UK, the US won't do it. And there we go, nothing happens. Are there any, um, anyone who has, um, so um, two questions here. We'll do the two first ones. Unfortunately, we only have time for two very we did, short we questions. We haven't had our Norway And I'll, I'll ask the Norwegian okay. question at the end. It's the uh, piece de la resistance, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sir. Could you please explain to us foreigners what is this British fascination with intermediation, with uh, people inserting themselves into the flow of value creation? I mean, old Adam Smith didn't even recognize it as value creation in the wealth of nation, but now a big chunk of the British GDP is financial intermediation. Um, we'll, we'll do both questions and then yeah. uh, a second one was here in the middle. I, I'm sorry, we, we, we uh, Arang Sharna, uh, they've been very strict that we have to let you go within our 50 minutes, so we only have time for two, please. I'll do it very quick. I'm Thomas from Copenhagen. If there is some genuine business as well served by the butlers, how would you even as a an officer in this system be able to see the difference between legal business and illegal business? So in answer to the second, the first question, obviously that, that's hard, but the answer I think is transparency. Um, if you know who owns what, um, uh, then you can see who owns the money that's moving. And, and then, you know, there are, there are some people who it's questionable, is it legal, is it illegal? But some people it's unquestionable. If it's the Medellin cartel, you're okay, you can go after that. So you can start at the, at the, at the top of the tree and then work your way down. Um, so I think the answer is, is transparency. And it's really good that that is spreading in the EU, um, uh, in, in the UK, in, in other countries, where even in the US now, increasing transparency. So that's going to make a big difference. Um, law enforcement sources, I mean, the thing they hate most is anonymous companies. It's a nightmare. Um, so that's going to be hopefully the answer to that problem. With regard to what is it with the British and inserting ourselves in the middle of financial flows. Um, it's indoor work, no heavy lifting. Um, uh, you know, uh, very profitable. Um, you don't need to get your clothes dirty. I mean, genuinely, I think it's that. I mean, if you can be paid for sitting on your behind in an office all day, and, you know, I mean, I have two brothers-in-law, both of whom I love dearly. One of them is a consultant anaesthetist uh, specialising in, in very small children, incredibly important, very, very difficult work, which requires precise judgments, you know, way more difficult than being an anaesthetist for adults. The other one is a, is a, a fund manager um, who moves money around on behalf of uh, some wealthy American investors. The consultant anaesthetist has a, 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 you know, a house um, in, on the outskirts of London, which he has a very large mortgage for. Um, his wife also works full time, um, but it's small. Um, the, the fund manager has a mansion, uh, and his wife doesn't work, she's fine. Um, and, and, and there you go, that's just how Britain values uh, different people in our society. And, um, you know, it's just until something snaps uh, and we decide to value consultants and anaesthetists more than we value people who move money around, sadly, I think people will keep moving money around. <laughs> So the final question uh, is not the traditional Norwegian question, how do you like Norway? Which we usually uh, ask foreigners to come here. But it's, it's uh, of course, all Norwegians know that we're, we're saints in a, uh, in a world of devils. Or are we? Well, what think, is it that we can do from a Norwegian perspective? I think, I think you, you got a lot of the devilry out of your system in relation to our monasteries about a thousand years ago. <laughs> um, uh, and these days, you are definitely more on the saintly side. Actually, I had, this, I had a very interesting day. Um, uh, it was either at the beginning of this month or the end of last month um, in London when the Norwegian Pension Fund had a seminar um, in London, uh, the Ethics Committee of the Norwegian Pension Fund, to discuss... Um, the issue of kleptocracy and how the fund should invest. And I don't think many people outside of Norway are aware of quite how large the Norwegian pension fund is. It owns 
somewhere between one and one and a half percent of all the shares in the world. It's one of the biggest investment funds in the world. It's colossal and doing very well. I mean, not this month, but in general. Um, <laughs> has been doing very well historically over the last decade. And, and I, the issue is of how do you get people out of the kleptocracy enabling business is, how do you, is to try and stop it being profitable for them. And the, the traditional way of doing that is to prosecute them, but that isn't going to happen in Britain. Um, so how do you come up with a competing incentive to encourage people to say, don't move money around for crooks and thieves, do the right thing, contribute to a civilization and democracy and the, and the future of our society? And I'm really heartened by this interest that the pension fund is taking in kleptocracy. And the, I have this, wouldn't it be fantastic if there was investors like the pension fund, maybe like the Californian pension fund, which is also very ethically run, which said to, to you know, the enablers of kleptocracy, accountants, lawyers, and so on, said, you can work, by all means, you can work for Russian oligarchs, you can work for you know, kleptocrats from Nigeria. Um, that's your choice. But if you do, you're not working for us. You know, make a choice. You can make a choice. You can work for the Norwegian Pension Fund, or you can work for Oligarch. And they will all choose the Norwegian Pension Fund. But they'd be insane not to, um, because you're richer than the oligarchs, um, <laughs> quite simply. And these people look, they go where the profits are. And so I, I'm really heartened by that, this, these suggestions. And I understand that you know, there are, you, know, very, you have to be very careful not to have political control of that kind of money because you know, that, that leads in all sorts of unfortunate directions. But having a strategic direction that the Norwegian pension fund is interested in not just short-term profits, but also in long-term future of civilization is an amazing thought and an incredibly powerful one. And I think one that Norway is almost uniquely able to fulfill. So, you know, and I'm not, you know, this is, it's sort of, I'm not just saying this because I think Norwegians are nice. I do, though I'm not sure about the brown cheese. Um, <laughs> um, I'm taking some to my wife. Get off this stage <laughs> now. That's... <laughs> no, um, thank you so much, Oliver Bolo. The book is uh, on sale somewhere here, and of course you can sign it. Is it... I can. Am I allowed to t tell them about the stamps mm. as well? He, Oliver, even has his own stamps that he stamps the book with. You can so, tell. Uh, <laughs> that costs a thousand pounds extra. Uh, it's more, some, some, some account in the Virgin Islands or something like that. The, you just wire it. The more powerful someone is in Eastern Europe, the more stamps they have. So I decided to make my own stamps. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Thank you.